He actually once thought about becoming a professional athlete. He says he's probably still the fastest runner of anyone at this conference. So I see that is a open challenge to everyone that next year he comes back and we have running contests in Central Park. Please welcome Rob. Thanks, Jared, and uh, great to be here. I'm uh, really disappointed I couldn't make it to New York in person, but uh, this is sort of the next best thing that I can get to go to the New York uh, conference uh, remotely. So I've, uh, given it's an R conference, I've set up all my merchandise appropriately. I have the R hex cushion behind me. I have my R hex mug uh, right here. And if I step outside, being at COVID-19, I have my R hex face mask ready to go. Okay, so uh, I'm gonna talk about ensemble forecasts with Fable. Fable is a package I've been working on with uh, Mitch O'Hara Wild for the last couple of years and uh, forecasting is what I generally do. Um, so let me first of all talk about uh, where I come from. So I come from Melbourne, not that one. When I tell people in the US I come from Melbourne, they often say, you mean Melbourne, Florida? No, uh, I come from this one. The one in, in Florida was named after the one in Australia. We have about 5 million people. The one in Florida has about 75,000 people. Melbourne is famous for lots of things, but Two of the things that it's famous for is, uh, is cafes and particularly coffee. Uh, in fact, when I was in New York visiting, uh, visiting the uh, meetup in New York a couple of years ago, I found a coffee shop selling what they branded as Melbourne coffee. And so if you do visit us, you can expect to go to these iconic laneways with lots of coffee shops and have our amazing coffee. Okay, so that's sort of a, a segue to what I want to talk about, which is uh, I'm going to use this data set as a uh, example, a vehicle of illustration of a few ideas. So this is monthly cafe turnover in Australia uh, for the last, well, since 2006, right up to the end of 2019. I've left out, uh, I'm not going to talk about 2020 because COVID-19 means that the turnover is all over the place. It's a little more difficult to forecast and we have to use different techniques. But I'm going to talk about forecasting um, the, la the year before, 2019. So you can see here's the, here's the, uh, the turnover in millions of Australian dollars. Um, you can see that it's trended, that there's some seasonality, um, particularly it's spiking up before the end of the year. So that's around Christmas. There's lots of activity going on. Drops down in January and then... I uh, have this sort of pattern during the year. So I just produced that uh, having uh, loaded the Fable package with um, the data set, which I've called train because it's the training data, and I piped it into Autoplot, and the name of the variable in the, in the data set is turnover. Okay, what I'm going to just, uh, before I show you some any real coding, I just want to introduce some ideas around how forecasting works and some of the concepts we use in forecasting. So I've taken the data set and I've just fitted a, uh, a model, an ETS model, which stands for exponential, exponential smoothing uh, applied to turnover. I'm see I'm missing a pipe on my second line there. So I take the train data, I pipe it into the model function. I fit these models, uh, this, this, this model, automatically it chooses the trend and the seasonality and whatever else it needs to select. And then I pass that, the missing pipe, pass that to generate, and I want five new um, series of each one length. So it generates these five possible future series. So it's simulating the future, and it's simulating it five times. And for um, each, each time it goes through, it chooses a different set of random uh, inputs into the model, so you get a different possible future. And one of the ways, a useful way to think about forecasting is it's trying to look at the all the different possible futures and think about probability distributions on those futures. So that's that's five possible futures. Now let's just zoom in on the end part of that so you can see it a little more clearly. And you can see each of the five sort of captures the overall seasonality, but there's some fluctuations around because of randomness. So I'm going to do that a lot more time. So there's about a thousand possible futures. And uh, we then look at those and, and look at the probability distribution at each 
of the um, time periods over that forecast horizon. Okay, so let's gray those out and think about what we might do with those simulated futures. So the most obvious thing is you might just take the mean of them. So at each time period, you just take the average of all of the simulated future values for that time, and that gives you a, uh, a graph that gives you the means, this blue line here. And they're what, when people talk about forecasting, that's what they often mean. They often mean the, the mean of those sample paths, or sometimes called the point forecast, because it's one point for each future time period. But because we're dealing with probabilities, it's actually much more interesting to look at some other aspects of the distribution. Um, for example, prediction intervals is the middle 80% of the sample paths um, as shown here. So for each time period, we just grab the middle 80% and uh, shade that, and that gives us a range within which the future is likely to lie with about um, probability 0.8. We could also do quantile forecasts. And in fact, the edges of these prediction intervals are quantile forecasts. The probability of it being above the upper limit is 10%. The probability of it being below the lower limit is 10%. So the bottom of this shaded region is the 10th um, percentile or the 0.1 quantile. And the top of the upper region is the 90th percentile or the 0.9 quantile. Okay, so we can do different quantiles. Um, we could compute all the deciles, for example. So the deciles are at the 10%, 20%, 30%, and so on. Um, and they're shown as these blue lines. Okay, so when we think about probabilistic forecasting, this is what we're doing. We're looking at the possible futures that might evolve and what the probabilities of those are. What's the probability of it being in different regions of this space? Um, and then we can look at what actually happened because I've fitted this model to the data up to the end of 2018 and then I've forecasted using these futures 2019 and um, so you can see the blue lines are the deciles of my forecast model. The black line is what actually happened. So the, the next thing to think about is to, is to think, well, how good was that forecast? Is, is what we predicted um, close to what actually happened? If we're just dealing with a point forecast, suppose we took the middle of these lines, which is the median, the 50th percentile, you can just look at the difference between that and what actually happened, and you can take the absolute differences and average them and get some measure of how good your forecast is. But because we're interested in the whole probability space, we can't just take the difference between each of these blue lines and the black line and get something that's um, particularly um, meaningful because, you know, there's only a 10% chance it's going to be above the, this top blue line and 90% chance is going to be below. So you would expect the blue line to be above the black line most of the time. So we need a way of measuring how good that is. Okay, so let's. this is the only maths I'm going to show you for the whole, whole talk, but I needed to introduce at least one equation here to show how we evaluate quantile forecasts. Okay, so if I let F... Um, be the quantile forecast with a certain probability at time t. So the probability might be 80% and it might be at a particular time period. And then that's the value of that um, predicted quantile. And then the actual observation is y sub t. So on that previous graph that I had, the uh, blue lines are the f and the black line is the y. And I've got different f values for different values of p and uh, this is the direction of t for time. Okay, and then what I'm going to do is calculate the quantile score, which is this equation here. So it's the difference between what you see and what you predicted. So the y might the black minus the blue for all the different values of p. That's this guy here, y minus f. And then, but I weight it based on how likely that probability is. And so that gives me a graph that looks like this. So what I'm showing here is, is this equation in graphical form. On the horizontal axis, we've got what's in the um, in this bracket here, yt minus f sub pt. So if it's zero, that means the black and the blue curves um, are exactly the same. Uh, if it's a positive value, 
um, then this is positive. If it's negative, then the absolute value makes this a positive value as well. The um, weight determines the slope of these lines. So you can see, if I just stop it here, uh, you can see that for when P is above 0.5, it's weighted more strongly up here and less strongly down there. But if I go to a, a smaller value of P, um, 0 0.05, then the probability of it being you know, below that number is pretty small, it's only 5%, so you want to weight the error more strongly. Whereas if it's above that value, that's pretty likely, 95% you weight that with not much weight there. So that's what's going on here with these, um, these uh, multipliers at the front. Okay, so what's good? Well, a low value of Q is good. That means you've done well in, in predicting what's going to happen in the future. Um, those of you who've done looked at these sort of things before, you might wonder, what have I got a 2 out the front for? You haven't seen it with a 2 before. That's often omitted, but actually I like to put it in because it makes it useful for interpretation. Because if P is a half, then 2 times a half is 1, and 2 times 1 minus a half is 1, and so Q is actually exactly the same as the absolute error. So it puts it on the same scale as the absolute error, but it's just weighting it based on how likely it is that you're going to exceed that number. The other reason for putting the 2 in front is that when I average these Q guys over all the possible values of P, I get what's called a continuous rank probability score, which is a measure overall of the accuracy of the whole distribution. So I average the QPTs over P, and I'll get a measure of how good my forecast was for that time period across all the different quantiles, as many as I wish to compute. Okay, let's see how this works in practice. So I'm going to introduce a couple of packages here. Um, the Sybil package, which was uh, largely developed by Ira Wang, um, and she's the most, still the main developer. She was a PhD student working with me and Di Cook at Monash up until um, a year or two ago. She's now a lecturer at the University of Auckland, which of course is famous in the R world because R was born at the University of Auckland in the Department of Statistics. So Ira now works there. In fact, she inherited Ross Ihaka's office, so she has some big shoes to fill. Ross Ihaka, for those who don't know, was one of the two people who started R. The other package I'm going to work with is Fable, um, which uh, the chief developer of that is Mitchell O'Hara Wild, who uh, works with me at Monash. So just a little bit about the names. Tibble is a time series Tibble, so TS for time series. Fable uh, has two meanings. One is it's a forecasting table, and secondly, it conveys the idea that a fable tells you tells you something um, important about reality, but it's not true itself. So a fable's a story that's not true, but it tells you something important about reality. Well, that's what a forecast is. It tells you something about what's going to happen. Okay, so let me just run through a quick example. So I'm going to take the Australian cafe data. Um, here it is here. Uh, so this is a Tibble. It's monthly data. I've got 168 rows and two columns. The first column is a date index. The second column is turnover. In, uh, in uh, that, is that millions? Yeah, millions of dollars. Um, so I'm going to filter it by um, take out the last year so that I can fit my model to some training data. And there I'm going to fit a couple of models, an ETS model and an ARIMA model. Um, I haven't got time to talk about what these models are, but they're two very common models used in time series forecasting. And it automatically chooses a couple of models. It automatically chooses an ETS model and it automatically chooses an ARIMA model for this data set. Then I'm going to produce some forecasts. So I pipe that into the forecast function and I say I want one year. It understands natural language. I can put that in as a string and it knows, okay, one year means 12 months. So it gives me 12 months for each of the, um, for each of the models. So it's given me back a fable, a forecasting table with 24 rows, 12 months by two models. So all of the forecasts for each, each of these two models. And it gives me a distribution. So the thing about Fable, which is different from my previous work on forecasting, is this is built around forecasting distributions, not just point forecasts. It does give you the mean as well if you need the point forecast, but we're going to be interested here in the turnover, which is the distribution. Okay, I'm going to pipe that into accuracy and say I want to use, I want to cal calculate the CRPS, the continuous rank probability score, and the root mean squared error. So it gives me back 
a little tibble um, with, I'm just going to look at this column, 31.3 is the best. Okay, so ETS is doing is giving me a value of 31.3. It's a little bit better than the ARIMA model. It's also better on root mean squared error, which is a measure of point forecast accuracy, whereas CRPS is a measure of distributional accuracy. Okay, so that's that's a quick intro to quantile forecasting. Now let me show you ensemble forecasting. So ensemble forecasting is where you grab multiple models and you mix the results together. So instead of just having one model here, we have multiple models and the future simulations are all mixed up. And we use the combination when we produce our quantiles. So the idea is that not all the models are not necessarily correct. Of course, they're just approximations to reality. So putting them together will give you um, better results. I think I said in the uh, blurb for this that I was going to talk about COVID-19, which I'm not going to, but I'm actually doing forecasting for the Australian government. And this is exactly what we do. We have multiple models for COVID-19 and we put them all together like this. And that's how we generate our probability forecast, which we provide to the Australian government every week and they make policy decisions as a result. And I know the same thing happens in other countries. There's a very good team in the US led by Nicholas Reich who does ensemble forecasting for your governments. Okay, um, so how do, we, how do we do ensemble forecasting with Fable? So here's, here's what I had before, exactly the same, filter the data, fit two models, produce some forecasts. All we need to do for ensemble forecasting is summarize it with a mixture. So I'm going to take a dist mixture. This is from the distributional package. And I'm going to take the two distributions, weight them equally, and create a new column, which is a mixture distribution. And I'm going to call this the ensemble. Um, that's it. That's all you have to do. Once you've got your distributions, you can create mixtures of distributions, as many as you want like that. Then I can pipe that into um, accuracy and see, well, how well did I do? Um, did putting these distributions actually help? Well, I got a CRPS of 31.7. Remember previously, my best was 31.3. So not quite as good as the ETS model on its own. Often an ensemble does better. In this case, it hasn't done quite as well as one of the models. Another way of using multiple models is called combination forecasting. And here, instead of mixing them together and in a mixture distribution, you take a weighted average of the forecasts. Um, very often a simple average, um, but the difference between this and ensemble forecasting is you take account of the relationship between the distributions. You need to account for the correlations between the errors of the distributions. So it's a little more complicated to, to do the mathematics. Um, you have to sort of think about what are the correlations between all the forecast errors. On the other hand, the coding is really, really simple. Um, just wanted to point out also that the mean done this way is exactly the same as the mean from the ensemble. It's the distribution is different, but not the mean. Okay, so here's my models, and that's all you need to do to compute computer combination forecast. You just take the models and you say, I want to do add them together and divide by two, or you can do any linear combination here create the forecast, and now I've got 36 rows because it's going to give me one for each of the two models plus another set of 12 forecasts for the combination. Produce my accuracy, and look what's happened. My combination forecast is actually slightly better in the distributional sense than either of my models. The point forecasts are slightly worse, actually, but the, the, point, the uh, distributional forecasts are slightly better. And I can create a tibble. Uh, uh, I can compare my tibble with the previous one, and you can see where the ensemble fits with the three that I've just created. Okay, so there's. Um, let me just zoom in on the on the uh, on the on the graph here. So there's my plotting both my combination and my ensemble at the same time. The combination is laid down in the first layer. The ensemble is on top of it, and so you, the ensemble is actually hiding the combination there. So let me just flip the order. So you can see, so I've flipped the order now and I've got the ensemble on the bottom and the combination on the top. And if you look really, really carefully, you can see that there's slightly, there's a little green bit poking out here and up the top, blue green. So the ensemble width is slightly larger than the combination width in this case. The point forecasts are the same. So you won't notice that middle line changing at all. It's only the edges of the distribution that are changing. So what's going on here is the combination 
averages two distributions. So here I've got one distribution, here I've got another distribution. And when you take the average, you get something in the middle. Whereas the mixture distribution draws a sample from each of them. So it's a more spread out like this. Okay, I see I'm running out of time. So uh, let me um, just quickly point out that combinations involve, I've said this, combinations involve averaging, but you do have to take account of the correlations. You can't just average the densities or anything like that. You have to do it correctly from a statistical perspective. Ensembles just mix them and you can ignore the correlations when you mix them. The means are the same, but other things are different. Okay, the nice thing about Fable is that it allows you to forecast many series simultaneously. Um, and in the rest of my slides, which I haven't got time to, to go through, um, you can do all of the um, forecasts for all of the Australian states. So I've got in my, um, in my slides this set of code. Um, so that's it for doing all of the calculations for all of the states. Um, and I've got that on my GitHub repo so you can, uh, you can have a play around with that. Let me just switch to the end because my time is up. Um, the slides and my code are on uh, my website, robjheinman.com slash nycr2020. The packages um, are also on my website. There's lots of papers and packages and other information, a blog about forecasting and so on. The particular packages I've talked about today are in the Tidyverts collection of packages. That stands for Tidy Version of Time Series. Um, and so tidyverts.org uh, gives you links to those packages. And we, uh, I have a textbook which uses the Fable package, otex.com slash fpp3. It's written using Bookdown. It's all free and online, of course. Um, and just a little bit of contact information down the bottom there. Okay, thank you. My time is up, so I will finish there. His tools, Fable, we, I've been using them for a long time. It's, a, uh, it's not a long time. For as long as they've been out, I've been testing them. But they've only been out for a couple of years. And we've actually had a number of members of Rob's team come out and speak at the meetup. So it was great to have you here. Thank you for kicking off the virtual conference. I know it's very late all the way over there in Melbourne. So we appreciate you being our first speaker kicking this off. Uh, we look forward to greeting you in New York again, uh, hopefully, hopefully in the next year.